This video is about Riemann sums. I'm going to explain what a Riemann sum is. Uh, this is all about if you're given a derivative of some function, the fact that from that derivative you can figure out changes in what that rate, in what that derivative or the rate is measuring. Uh, and a couple of quick examples of that is if you're given a velocity function, you can use antiderivatives to figure out the, the total distance traveled. Or if you're given, say, the rate of change of the number of people standing in line in a, at a checkout counter, you can use antiderivatives to figure out the uh, total change in the number of people in line. If you, if you know somebody's keystroke rate, then you can use antiderivatives to figure out the, the number of keys the, 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 they pressed and so on and so on. Uh, generally speaking, the rule is this. Uh, the principle is this. If you're given a derivative or some kind of a function, right, some f prime, then from that, if you want the total change in what the rate is measuring, you would just use antiderivatives. Typically, we take the derivative function, anti-differentiate it, and we take a, um, a difference we interpret uh, the difference in the antiderivative uh, as the thing that we we want and that is actually that actually has its has its own symbol if you're given the derivative at f prime the total change in one of its antiderivatives from a to b from wherever to wherever actually has its own symbol that's this it's f it's whatever the derivative function is, dx, from x equals a to x equals b. It, so it, it, it has the antiderivative symbol in it, only it's got this a and b here. This is, whenever you're looking for a total change, this is what you're actually finding. This is the symbol for finding a total change. So let me just go over that really quick. I have a... Uh, I have a picture here. I hope that we can see. Here is an f prime function. All right, so there's an f prime graph, and I have uh, graphed over on top of it three examples of antiderivatives of th this function. So these are like sample f's. This is like f1, f2, and f3. But they're all anti antiderivatives of this. Now the claim is that if you know what this function is, let's say that we're interested in knowing what the change. Let's say that this is a velocity function for simplicity's sake, and we want to know uh, the total distance traveled by the object traveling with that velocity. And let's assume further that we're we're interested in it from x or I'm sorry, from t is here to t is here. We can see that. When we anti, when we take this function and we anti-differentiate it, we get any one of these functions that we want. And all we have to do is take the difference in these functions on that time interval. I'm just going to mark it here to show you geometrically what I'm talking about. We want t is a to t is b. So I mark this. And we say that if we're looking for a difference, we don't have to worry about um, picking out the constant of integration c and here's why it doesn't matter because what we're figuring out in each case is just this difference we're figuring out the length of this line that's the change in the anti in the uh, anti derivative and it's the same no matter which one we pick it's this length All right it's this length so that's why the uh, constant doesn't matter and we're looking for this change the whole time. That's typically how it's done if you're given a function. But the question that I'm going to explore here is, what if you're not explicitly given what this function is? All right. Now, lots of times when you're out, out in the field and you're measuring data or whatever, uh, you're, not going to, you're not going to come across a, a function like, oh, the, the, you're not going to measure rate and it's not going to be something like, Oh, look, it's t squared plus 2t minus sine of t over something. No, 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 no. It's not going to be like that. All right. What you're more likely going to get is a bunch of data points like this. All right. You'll get something like more like this. All right. You'll get a bunch of uh, y prime points or f prime points, um, the number of which depends on the accuracy of however it is that you're choosing t to measure it. So you might be given just a series of these inputs and outputs 
like this. Or you could just have to say, oh, what if it's like this? What if this is y prime? I want to know what is the total change in y from this point to this point. How do you figure that out? If you can't use antiderivatives, if there's no function to take the antiderivative of, up until now, we're out of luck, and we need a new interpretation of that. We need a different way of looking at this at this problem. So, um, I'm going to make a claim here, and I claim that the area beneath the derivative curve is equal to the total change in its antiderivatives. So, it's just another way of looking at what um, we're trying to, to, to get here. Let me explain this claim a little bit further. If I take, let's come back to, to this example here. Uh, my claim is that if I pick a different, uh, I could probably pick the, nah, if I pick a different region here, say that, again, here's the F prime curve, and I'm interested in the total change in F from here to here, say. So that's from here to here. We're computing, all right, when we anti-differentiate and we take a difference, we're computing the length of this line segment, and that's the total change in f. I could use any, you know, I could use any one of these. But the claim is that these lengths are equal to the area beneath the derivative curve. This shaded area is another interpretation of this length. This length equals this length equals the area under the derivative curve. Um, I just want to substantiate that it, it really is true, but to motivate the uh, why that ought to be true, I want you to examine this real quick with me. Suppose that you are given a simple rate. All right? Let's say that you know that the velocity of a particle is, let's go with constant, we'll say it's constant, and it's just this. All right, we'll say it's three meters per second, three meters per second. And suppose that you're interested in knowing how far does the object travel from t is zero to t is, say, five. Well, just from you know regular grade school math, it would be uh, three times five, right? It would be the distance equals rate times time. So it's traveling three meters per second for a total duration of five seconds. So it's three times five or 15 meters. Well, that 15, has a geometric interpretation. It's that, it's this area. So this area is equal to the total distance traveled. Well, that's all fine and good if it's just, if the function that you're dealing with is just one straight line, but uh, let me just change it up a little bit. All right, what if it's constant from zero to five, but then uh, let's say from five to 10, if 10's out here, uh, it jumps up just a little bit. And let's say it goes to four at that point. All right, so it's some, imagine something that's real extreme, something like that. So from zero to five is three meters per second. From five to 10, it's four meters per second. How would you handle that? You would probably handle it very similarly. You would say, oh, all right, well, maybe, maybe this little transitional period doesn't really matter a whole lot. And I'll just kind of focus on here, where it's traveling at four meters per second for these extra five seconds. So that's going to tack on an additional twenty to the former fifteen. And you could, and that would be the correct answer, right? Because if it's going three meters per second for five seconds, and then four meters per second for five seconds, it's going to be fifteen plus twenty equals a total of thirty-five meters. Well. Again, you might say, well, that's all fine and dandy if, if, if the function that you're dealing with is just a bunch of straight lines. But think about this for a second, all right? What if instead of making these, and now, this is a really large jump, right? Let's say that the jumps that are being made are really, really tiny. And let's further say that instead of going for durations of something huge, like five seconds, it's only going for like microns. So we could have, you should imagine something changing, like these little steps. Imagine a bunch of these little baby steps going up to wherever it is, right? What you would do to find the total distance traveled is you would figure out the area underneath all of these flat pieces and all the individual areas would give you the individual um, changes over those little baby periods and you would just add those all up and that would be the total change well in essence that's pretty much what you get if you have a curve right and not a sequence of straight lines
What I'm saying is we could ballpark uh, or we can get a really good approximation of the area under a curve by sort of pretending that it's just a bunch of these little flat lines. No matter how curvy it is, if you have something that's like this, if you break it up into enough of these little small pieces, I mean, we could do this millions and billions of times, you can get it to as much accuracy as you want. The idea of local linearity also comes into play here because re remember, when you zoom in on a function millions and millions of times, if we look at it from the, micro from the microscopic level, all of these curvy segments, no matter how curvy they appear when we zoom out, they all are pretty much, it, when you zoom down to it, straight lines. So they're all looking like this locally. And so you could figure it out. If, if, you, if you buy into the fact that we're looking for areas, you could say, well, there's going to be one height of the, there's definitely going to be one rectangle there that's going to really drive it home, right? That's really going to give me that actual area. So if this is really, really small, um, the function itself is approximately linear, and so rectangles do the job just fine. And adding up a bunch of areas of these rectangles, that is what a Riemann sum is, right? When you sum the areas of these rectangles over a large interval like this, so as to fill the entire area beneath a curve, imagine that we took this back here again say and we broke it up into millions and millions of pieces each of which we approximated with a rectangle all right what we would get is a really good estimation of the area under the, this curve and so the a, a really good approximation of the length of this line now, hopefully that's enough to convince you that uh, computing a rate of uh, computing a total change to compute something like this, the f prime of x dx, which we symbolize by this, the total change in f. To compute this, it's similar to computing the area under the rate curve. If you buy that, then knowing what a Riemann sum is is pretty simple. I have a, I do have one example worked out for you or set up for us here. Um, if you were measuring, say that you were measuring the, the, the rate at which cars pass through a toll booth, you might get something like this chart here, right? After hour one, uh, y if you measure it at that, a after the first hour, you might measure 300 cars per hour, and then at, at two, 250 cars per hour, and so on and so on and so on. This data makes up this graph here. And if you want to ask, it, so we want to know the question, how many cars in total pass through the toll booth over this six hour period if these are the rates. Well, what we're gonna do is if you recognize that it's really just an area problem we're gonna try to make an attempt at a try to get a ballpark estimate as to what the area is and we generally do that in three ways with three kinds of Riemann sums. This first one is, is called a, uh, a left endpoint re Riemann sum. What we do is we take the take the region. I'm gonna make these really light. Take the region and you divide it up into into these pieces. And to calculate the heights of each of your rectangles, you use the left endpoint of all of these subintervals. So for this first one here, the left endpoint is this 200, and we're gonna ballpark it with that rectangle. Now that's clearly an, an underestimate. There are lots of uh, ways of improving the accuracy of this, but um, this is what it is for now. If we choose to do a left endpoint sum, this is what we're going to get. We'll get this for the first rectangle. Maybe that'll be R1. Uh, its height is going to be 200, and its length is going to be 1. The second one, right, this rectangle here, since we're using left endpoint, we'll get this. And now there's a bunch of overshoot here, right? Now maybe that'll account for some of the wasted space here. If you do this over a long enough period, it, you, and if your rectangles are, 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 are small enough, it'll pretty much balance itself out. Um, but we're not after the most accurate thing in the world here. I just want to teach the idea. So that's for the first one. That's for the second one. And the third one is this. The fourth one would be that. 
the fifth one would be this, the sixth one would be that. And we have six rectangles here, and just like so. Now clearly this is going to be an underestimate of the number that we're searching for. But again, don't worry about it, it's just to teach the idea of what a Riemann sum is. So, uh, all to finish it off, what we do is we add up all these, um, we add up the areas of all these rectangles. And in this case, it's going to be, since all of our, uh, our widths down here are just a, a length of one, it's going to be 200 plus 300 plus 250 plus 250 plus 300 plus 400. And that's going to be the estimate. It's going to be, it's going to be an underestimate, but, um, what are you going to do? So I'll say left endpoint, Riemann sum. Uh, and the total number that we get is going to be 1700. All right. That's an underestimate. But that's not the only estimate that we can do. That's only a left endpoint Riemann sum. The two other ones that we typically use are uh, right endpoint and midpoint. So let me do a right endpoint here. So a right endpoint, just to show you how that works out. Uh, if I do the, if I do a right endpoint sum, then I use the right endpoints of all these uh, little sub intervals here, rather than the left. So I'll use that for the first one, that for the second one, that for the third one, fourth. All right. And I get this. And it, it appears that we have an overestimate of what it's going to be. But you, again, we're not going for accuracy. Just add these up and see what we, we get. And that turns out to be to be 1950. Now, you know that if, the, if, if, if this were something that we actually had to c compute here, you would you could be sure that the, the the actual answer is going to be between these two numbers and there's one more way that we do these and that's with a midpoint midpoint sum so this is usually I would say the best way to go um, what we have to do is break it up a little bit in a little bit of a different way here since we're going to use the midpoints of the intervals to determine the heights of our rectangles, we have to use a different number of subintervals. Instead of making um, six rectangles, I'm only going to make I'm only going to be able to make three here. So I'll say this will be my first one, and this will be my second one. This will be my third one because we want midpoints. So for this first rectangle here, I'm going to use this the middle point to determine its height and that gets ballpark like that and that's one big rectangle and then the middle the one in the middle we're going to use this for its height and that's some over some under and then the same thing for this last one it's some under some over some under and this is a midpoint sum we have to use three three different rectangles because we only have three midpoints to use but if we add all these up, which would be 2 times 300 plus a length of 2 times 250 plus a length of 2 times 400, we get 1900, which is probably the, which looks like it might be a little bit of an overestimate, but it's closer than, than either, than either of these two. And so if we're given a function, um, if we're given a rate that's not an actual function that we can use to anti-differentiate, we can use uh, Riemann sums to determine what the total change is. All right? What we are determining here, by the way, is called, uh, uh, don't forget that what we're doing is we're finding the values of, in, of definite integrals. When I ballpark the area under this C of T curve here, I'm finding... Uh, the definite integral, it's called, from 0 to 6 of C of t, dt. That's what that means. So this, it, these three numbers here are three approximations of this, 
which are measured in cars. All right, so there are three ballpark approximations of the number of cars that pass through the intersection from zero to six. That's what that symbol means. Um, uh, because I have a couple minutes left before I finish up, I do want to say that there is an interesting twist to this problem. Um, we have this equality among areas under curves and changes in functions. So that now we can flip this case around and if we do know what this function is, if we're given it, if, if it's like an f of x equals whatever, if we're given what this function is and we know how to anti-differentiate it, this gives us an indirect way of finding what areas are, right? We have the equality of these three things here. We have the change, if you're given an f of x, right? the change in the antiderivative is equal to the area under the curve. So if we're after the area under the curve, all we need to do is figure out what the antiderivative of the function is and take a change in it. Both of these things equivalently get symbolized by this, and this is called the definite integral. Uh, the last way to represent this would be big F of B minus big F of A where big F is any antiderivative of little f. So all four of these expressions mean the same thing, area under the curve and all that. Um, and I think that's that's about it. We can do we can do Riemann sums now. If you have anything that asks for a Riemann sum, just know that all that you have to do is add up the areas of some of these rectangles no big deal, and that the value of the added areas equals the uh, the total accumulated change in what the um, in, in in what the rate function is measuring.